So today on the webinar for First Bank, we, we welcome everyone. We're glad you were able to join us today. We're excited to have not only our CEO, Michael Williamson, who you will hear from shortly, but also world-renowned thinker, author, executive coach, Marshall Goldsmith. Marshall is in the Thinkers 50 Hall of Fame. Let, these, let the, this data soak in for a moment as I share with you some of the experience and some of the, the accolades that, that Marshall has and how just lucky we are to have him with us today. Again, part of the Thinkers 50 Hall of Fame. He is the, and I got to put my glasses on for this to make sure I read it correctly. He is the two-time number one leader in the Thinkers Hall of Fame. So he's not only in the Thinkers Hall of Fame, he's been the number one thinker uh, two times. He's been ranked as the number one executive coach of the year in the world. Again, let that sink in a little bit. And he has four New York Times bestsellers, and I believe you've sold over 3 million books throughout the course of your time writing books. So, Marshall, thank you so much for being with us. I'm going to start, however, by going to Michael. Michael's been our CEO at the bank for coming up on about a year. And uh, Michael, I'd love for you to just tell our, our, our audience a little bit about yourself, how you got into this role, your, your, a brief a little bit about your journey coming into the role you're currently in with First Bank. Then I know you read, you mentioned as we talked about this, you've read Marshall's book, What Got You There Won't Get You, or What Got You Here Won't Get You There. So I'd love to have you start by sharing your impressions and any questions you have out of the gate for, for Marshall. So Michael, take it away. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, and I first thing I'm going to do is is thank Marshall for being here. I am so excited. I, I, I'm, I hate to say it, I'm kind of giddy yeah, um, because Marshall's thoughts and his books helped me realize that I needed to change. Mm -hmm. And that was part of my journey. And then carrying that to others has continued to be part of my journey. Um, early in my career, I did time at, at the big banks where you learn how to be a good banker. You learn how to spread a loan. You learn how to look at client profitability, but you don't learn how to lead. You right. learn how to be a great performer. And as I transitioned between those big banks and then got into a regional community bank where I became a player coach, I realized some of the things that I was doing that made me a great player, the player that everyone wanted on the team, didn't make me a great leader for other great players. So I had a good team, but I didn't have great players on that team. Mm. And in reading Marshall's book, it, it really changed my philosophy on what success was and how I define success in my roles. Because I had so many of the bad traits that he talked about in that <laughs> book. Um, in fact, I could probably just prioritize them because I had all of them. Um, <laughs> And what I found was if, in, and in that book, it talks about sharing and what got you here won't get you there. It talks about sharing your journey with the people around you. And it was talking about, you know, redefining, and it was me working with my team to redefine my own personal definition of success and moving it from someone who achieved their goals, someone who always hit those targets and had everyone in the company thinking they were the player. <laughs> the becoming the person that everyone wanted, the best players wanted to be on that team because they got the support that they needed so <laughs> they could become the best players. And then they had a path on that journey that they could go down to say, hey, I, I'm a great player, but I want to become a leader. And they, they were able to see someone that had done that. And hopefully that was me. Or they could say, hey, you know what? I'm very comfortable being a great player. That is where I find happiness and success. And then allowing them to do that. So for years, um, through my last big bank run, and then as I moved into a, a smaller community bank, I used that book with people coming into my team. And I actually did a little bit of uh, coaching around it as we would move forward and, and do our annual meetings. So it's helped me redefine myself multiple times throughout my career. And, and I think that's what thought leaders like Marshall do is they put a thought in your head and then it's up to you to internalize that. So I, I started with, as a player coach with a small community bank, we were a little over a billion and a half dollars. When I left that company 10 years later, um, we had, I had been the CEO for three years and we were a $7 billion company. 
we sold that bank for, uh, it was a privately owned bank. We sold it to a publicly traded entity and I went public for a little while. And what I found is going back public, it's very hard to lead in a public institution sometimes. Mm -hmm. And I found First Bank and I found the Deerberg family. And a year ago, the Deerbergs and I made a, a decision that this was going to be the right place for me uh, to grow and learn and carry their legacy of what it meant to be a, a family owned institution forward. So I, I probably went longer than, than you had planned for me, Ed, but I, like I said, I'm giddy. I'm going to ramble a little yeah. bit today. Well, no, I appreciate that. And it's funny because the first question that I actually have on my bullet points of questions and you and I didn't script this, so this is perfect. Marshall, you, you've talked in all your books that I've read about behavioral changes. First of all, thank you again for joining us today. We want to give the platform to you throughout mm -hmm. this. People love Michael and me and First Bank and what we do, but they're here today to hear you. Um, you talk about behavioral patterns and behavioral changes in leaders. What have mm -hmm. you, And Michael just alluded to that in himself and his behavioral changes. What has led you to that knowledge? I always am curious when someone is a thought leader or an executive coach, how did you get to that point where you started seeing that there were behaviors out there in this world, in leadership, in companies that needed to be changed and that you could do something about that? Well, you know, I'm a pioneer in something called customized 360 degree feedback. So in my role, I started giving leaders feedback and finding out what they're doing well and what they're not doing well. And I want to go back to Michael because some of the comments you made are exactly what I found out. I was interviewed in the Harvard Business Review and said, you know, what's the number one problem of all the successful people you've coached over the years? And my, my answer is very similar to what he said, winning too much, winning too much. Because, you know, as Michael said, when you're in a doer position, you want to win. And it's about you winning, but you got to learn to let go of that stuff. And, you know, what happens is it's important we want to win. If it's meaningful, we want to win. If it's trivial, we want to win. If it's not worth it, we want to win anyway. Yeah. So I use an example, not only at work, but at home. You want to go to dinner at restaurant X. Your husband, wife, friend, or partner wants to go to dinner at restaurant Y. You have a heated argument. You go to Y. The food tastes awful. The service is terrible. Option A, critique the food. Point out our partner was wrong. This mistake could have been avoided if you listen to me, 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 me. Yeah. Or option B, shut up. <laughs> Eat stupid food. Try to enjoy it and have a nice night. What would I do? What should I do? Now, almost all my clients, what would I do? Critique the food. What should I do? Shut up. Well, <laughs> as Michael said, it's hard for winners not to win. Yeah. Case study number two, you have a hard day at work. You come home. Your husband, wife, friend, or partner is there. The other person says, I had such a hard day. If we're not careful, we say, you had a hard day. You had a hard day. You mean any what I had to put up with today? We're so competitive, we have to prove we're more miserable than the people who live with us. Yeah. Yeah, we're either better or worse than everybody we talk to. We're always comparing. <laughs> and so I gave this example to my class at the Dartmouth Tuck School. A young guy raised his hand. He said, I did that last week. I asked him what happened. He said, my wife looked at me and said, honey, you just think you've had a hard day. It is not over. <laughs> yeah, you think it's been hard till now, right? I love that. Not over. <laughs> oh. That's excellent. So you've written these books, 3 million books sold, you know, four New York Times bestsellers. The one that's, I think, the one that everybody has read, again, I've held it up once already, and with the glare, you can't see it, but the what got you here won't get you there. And I love the, the, um, the, the tagline under how successful people become even more successful. How do you help somebody who has had a lot of success recognize that there's still more that they can do because there's so much of that. Well, Hey, look at me, look what I've done. Leave me alone. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Pat Riley years ago wrote a book. If it ain't broke, break it. He won all these championships with the Lakers and then the Miami heat. And it's like you're breaking it down every year. How do you convince that successful leader that they really do need to break it? and retool so that they continue that success? Well, you know, the first thing is this success delusion. You know, we all fall into something called the superstition trap. What's that? I behave this way. I am successful. Therefore, I must be successful because I behave this way. Wrong. Everyone I meet is successful because they do many things right, in spite of doing some things that are dumb. I've never met anyone who was so wonderful. They had nothing on the in spite of list. We all have something on the in spite of list. Right. So that's number one. And number two, 
I behaved this way, I was successful in the past, therefore this will help me be successful in the future. Wrong again. <laughs> as Michael pointed out, you did something, it helped you be a success in the past, but you don't live in the past. That same behavior that led to your success in the past is dysfunctional now. In the past, you wanted to be the star, you wanted to be the winner. Now you gotta make them the winner. It's a different job. It's a very different job. And being the winner is not what you want to do. You want to make them the winner. Well, one of the great leaders I ever coached said, you know, for the great, the great achiever, it might be all about me, but for the great leader, it's about them. Mm, it's not wonderful. about you. That's so powerful. Great leadership is really about your people. So appreciate you sharing that. Can you talk about the process of writing that book? What got you here won't get you there. What what was the impetus behind that? And just that. You know, I think many of us either have written books or are writing a book. I was lucky enough to write one that you participated in recently. So thank you for that. Um, but um, I'm curious for you what that process is like. How do you write for New York Times bestsellers? <laughs> well, the start with uh, that book was inspired by Peter Drucker. Peter uh -huh. Drucker, the, you know, I got ranked number one leadership thing in the world. But my brain compared to his was that of a 10 year old. I mean, mm -hmm. I don't say it to be modest. That guy was smart. And one of the things he taught me is he said, we spend a lot of time teaching leaders what to do. We don't spend enough time teaching leaders what to stop. And he said, half leaders, I mean, don't need to learn what to do. They learn, need to learn what to stop. Well, that one comment from Peter Drucker led to the book. And Michael, as you said, those 20 things you read, that came from that Peter Drucker inspiration. And how do I write the books? Are you ready? Hmm. I'm going to give you the secret of writing four New York Times bestsellers. You know what it is? Find somebody that can write. <laughs> there you go. Step I one. Write, I didn't write any of those books, right? Mm -hmm. If you look closely at the book, it says Marshall Goldsmith, Mark Ryder. Yep. Now, Mark and I, we've done four books together. They've all been New York Times bestsellers. We've sold three million books together. And he is the writer and I'm the thinker. So what I do is I talk, we were talking today on the phone an hour before this call. We're doing our next book right now called Being Here While Getting There, about being present. Mm -hmm. So we're working on our next book together right now. He's a great guy. And look, he can write better than I can. And I'm a good writer. I mean, I had a column in Harvard Business Review. I've had a column in Inc. Magazine, many magazines. I still have a column in Chief Executive Magazine. I'm a good writer, but not as good as him. And the reality is I could not have written any of those books. He's also my agent. So he's my agent, a co-author. We split everything 50-50 with -50. great partners, great relationship. So, you know, that's it. And it spends about, it takes about a year to write a book. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of dialogue, discussion. He tapes everything. We're talking again on Saturday. You know, we just keep going over stuff. And then he tapes it and we talk more and go on. Then we have a book. <laughs> yep. Great process. Michael, I, I want to make sure that I know you have a list of questions and I don't want to hog the show here. So feel free to, to go anywhere you'd like to go here. Well, that's <clears throat> yes, I, I actually do have some questions. Yeah. So as as you're coaching leaders, as you've gone in and you started to you, you finally get buy in, because I know that a lot of your book talks about how to get buy in. I love the 360 feedback. Uh, we're instituting that at. Uh, at First Bank, which is great, and, and it's a new environment for us. But as you get the buy-in, how do you get leaders to reinforce those behaviors for themselves over time? Uh, I, I'll be honest, I find myself backsliding. I'm a value-add person. Um, I like to break down every topic that we get in and talk about, and I want to add value, and a lot of times I need to just look at my team and go, I trust you, and okay. I backslide. How do you help that? Time out, coaching moment. Now, do you want some free coaching on this call? Yes, <laughs> we'll take it. One of the things I'm talking about in the book and those bad habits is an excessive need to be me. Now, what you just did is you said kind of that's the way I am. Quit thinking that way. Because when you say that's just yep. the way I am, you're really decreasing your odds on ever getting better. You're putting and I'm giving my in. I'm giving myself permission to continue the behavior. That's right. That's right. Now, so now feed forward. Now I'll give you ideas what you're supposed to say back to me now. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate that. I'm yeah. I I'm this is great. 
<laughs> it, go, it goes know. right back to what got you here. It, it's act, I think that exact you, you quote didn't, you, didn't, <laughs> you didn't know you were going to get coaching here, right? There you go. I was hoping. <laughs> now, let me tell you what I do with my clients. My clients don't have a choice. One, they have to get confidential feedback. That's not a vote. Hmm. Two, they need to talk to people about what they learned. That is not a vote. Three, they need to apologize for their sins. That's not a vote. Then they have to follow up on a regular basis. Now, what happens if they don't want to do that? Guess what? I don't work with them. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. I don't work with them. I don't have to do this, right? I like I tell my clients, you don't care, I don't care. Now, <laughs> now, one more coaching for you. Ready? More Michael, ready for more coaching? Yes, sir. You've got some silly guilt complex about relapsing and needing help and all that stuff. Get over it. We all need help. Quit being ashamed of needing help. If you could do it by yourself, you'd do it. Look, one thing I talk about in the book is a daily question process. I've had someone call me on the phone almost every day for 27 years to help me. 27 years, almost daily, just did it an hour ago. Almost every day I do this. Why? I can't do all this stuff by myself. My name is Marshall. I'm too cowardly and undisciplined to do any of the things I teach by myself. I need help. And you know what? It's okay. It's okay to need help. So, Michael, my coaching for you is get over that shame about needing help. We all need help. It's okay. I need help. You need help. We all. And by the way, all those fancy people I coach, if they didn't need any help, what they're hiring me for. There you go. <laughs> absolutely wonderful feedback and thank you uh you know we all need coaches now Definitely. you mentioned one other thing that you used to fall into a traps called adding too much value and let's talk about that one i'm young smart and enthusiastic i come to you with an idea you think it's a great idea rather than just saying great idea our natural tendency is to say well that's a nice idea why don't you add this to it well the problem is the quality of the idea may go up five percent my commitment to execute just went down 50 percent it's not my idea boss now it's your idea yeah. incredibly difficult for smart successful people not to constantly add value now one of my good coaching clients retired a few years ago his name jp garnier he was still a very large drug company glaxo smith klein so i said jp what'd you learn about leadership as a ceo of this huge company he said i learned a hard lesson my suggestions become orders now, I said, if they're smart, they're orders. If they're stupid, they're orders. If I want them to be orders, they're orders. I don't want them to be orders, orders anyway. <laughs> For nine years, I trained animals in the United States Navy. What's the first thing I always teach new animals? You get that star? Your suggestions become orders. Admirals don't make suggestions. An admiral makes a suggestion. What's the response? Aye, aye. That suggestion becomes an order. So I asked JP, what did you learn from me when I was your coach that helped you the most? He said, you taught me one lesson to help me be a better leader and have a happier life. I said, what was it? He said, before I speak, stop and breathe and ask myself one question. Is it worth it? Not just am I right. Is it worth it? And he said, as the CEO of this company, percent of the time, if I had the discipline to stop and ask, is it worth it? What did I decide? Am I right? Eh, maybe. Is it worth it? No. That's so true. I hadn't really thought about that. You know, when the, when the leader speaks, it is, it's not really a up for interpretation as much as it's okay. Well, this is what he or she wants. I'm going to go do. That's so, it. so you've talked about, um, I, I wrote down the old dog, new tricks while you were talking. And so how do you tell, oh, sorry, I got this fly. How do you, how does that leader begin that process of transitioning from that old behavior? I mean, we're conditioned. Maybe in many cases, it's something we, in most cases, it's something we learned when we were five. When dad talks, I shut up and I go do what dad says. Now I become that dad and I'm doing that. How do you, you, you talk about four steps. What are some ideas that you have developed over the years or seen where people can begin to transition from that? I'm the leader. I've got these thousand employees. I'm speaking for Michael for a moment. Yeah, um, yeah. How can I speak and make it look like it, I'm looking more for collaboration rather than delegation? Well, first, don't worry about making it look like that. Actually, make it be that. <laughs> Solid point. Solid <laughs> point. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, just the thing is just keep getting input. One thing I teach is called feed forward. You ask for ideas. You listen. You shut up. You say thank you. Now, as a CEO, you can't promise to change everything. 
you do promise to listen. So every leader I meet gets feedback. So let's say I want to get better at not adding too much value. So I go back. I apologize for my mistakes. You know, I'm sorry if I've done this in the past. Thank people for giving me feedback. Then I say, and in the future, I'm going to follow up with you. Give me any ideas or suggestions you might have to help me do a great job of not adding too much value, adding value when I should, but not when I shouldn't. What ideas do you have? Then whatever they say, sit there, shut up, listen, take notes and say thank you. And you do this over and over and over again. And guess what happens? You get better. Now, I did a research study called Leadership as a Contact Sport. Anyone wants a copy of it, send me an email, marshall at marshallwilson.com. It's online. Leadership as a Contact Sport. If you do this stuff, you get better. Now, you know what else I've learned? If you don't do the stuff, it doesn't really help a whole lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Arnold Schwarzenegger got a good quote. Nobody got muscles by watching me lift weights. You got to lift the weights. You got to go into the gym and pump the iron yourself. <laughs> you, you do the stuff I teach, you're going to get better, but you don't get better because I talk to you. You, you, have to, you. you actually have to work in order to get better. I love that. All uh, right, Michael. Anyway, yeah. Yeah, I, go ahead, the, the client I coached that improved the most was the client I spent the least amount of time with. The client I spent the most amount of time with didn't improve at all, didn't get paid. <laughs> I made a chart on one dimension called time spent with executive coach Marshall Goldsmith. The other dimension is called improvement. There's a clear negative relationship between spending time with me and improving. Well, I thought, <laughs> well, this is troublesome. So I go talk to my friend who improved the most. His name is Alan Mulally. Alan one of the great leaders of this century. Turned Ford around. The stock went from 101 to 1840. He uh, was CEO of the year in the United States. Had a 97 approval rating for every employee in a union company when he left. The United, that's unheard of, right? Yeah. Just an amazing human being. So I said, Alan, now I've, I've known Alan for 30 years. We're writing a book together. So I said, Alan, of all the people I've ever coached, you improved the most. I spent the least amount of time coaching you. I said, Alan, I made a chart here. Time spent with me in improvement. The way this chart looks, had you never met me, you'd been even better. <laughs> That's so I right. said, Alan, now what should I learn about coaching from you? He, he taught me two lessons. One is that, number one, Marshall, your whole job is customer selection. You pick the right customer, you win. You pick the wrong customer, you lose. And he said, don't make coaching about yourself, your own ego, and how smart you think you are. Make it about the great people you coach, how proud you are of them. That lesson changed my life. Look, I got ranked number one coach in the world for years. Nobody knows I'm a good coach. I may or may not be a good coach. I doubt I'm number one coach in the whole world year after year. It's statistically unlikely. I can tell you one thing. I get the best clients in the world. Mm -hmm. You work with yeah. people I work with, you're going to look like a good coach. Great coaching is you work with great people. And if, by the way, if people don't care, don't waste your time. Now, let's have some more coaching for you guys. Are you ready? Yeah, please. Have either of you ever attempted to change the behavior of a husband, wife, or partner that had no interest in changing? Have you ever tried that before? I'm going to plead the fifth, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. How's that working out for you? Yeah, not so good. Yeah. Did you ever try to change the behavior of mommy or daddy who had no interest in changing? You tried that before? Yes. Yes. Even worse. I was teaching yep. my class at Johnson & Johnson. A woman raised her hand and said, you try to change mommy or daddy? She said, Daddy. I asked her, what's daddy's problem? She said, daddy does not have a healthy lifestyle. So I asked her, uh, how old is daddy? She said, 94 years old. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently it's been working. <laughs> Leave the old boy alone. That's right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Great lesson for coaching. If, if they don't care, don't waste your time. They're not going to get any better. Yeah. Work with people that care. That's so true. Michael? Well, as we move, as as we evolve and mature as leaders, we also become coaches for the people around us. That's part of leading. Yes. What are some of the obstacles that as a leader, we can look for in our people that they'll need to overcome so that they actually start to embrace the new habits that they have? Because I find if I can remove our obstacles or at least point them out, um, it, it helps. So I would love to be able to have a little insight from you on the major obstacles you see for leaders in, in really changing their behavior so that it becomes a, a new habit? Well, the first thing is start with yourself. I always say that. Never preach at others to do anything as a leader you're not doing yourself. Always you go first. Then have them get feedback. 
And then when they get feedback, they talk to you. Here's what I feel good about. Here's one. They, you don't have to see the numbers or all that, but just the top line. Then you talk with them and you see if you have something you wanted to work on, you share that as well. You give them just one or two important things to work on, not 50 or 100. They can change 50 things anyway. Give them two or three of the most important things or one or two of the most important things. And you say, look, I'm going to follow up with you and I want you to follow up with your people and I want to help you get better. There's no reason you can't do the stuff I teach. So in, a, in another follow-up, so we, we talked a little bit about how do you change habits and how do you start to lead? You mentioned something very early on that I found very, very helpful with the 20 behaviors that you listed in your book or things you need to stop doing. Right. Um, how do you get people to self-actualize? Or Because I, I struggle with self-actualization and I love your feedback from me. Get a coach. Uh, <laughs> now you just said... I struggle with, I want you to raise your right hand, repeat after me. <laughs> I used to struggle with this. I used to struggle with this. I, 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 I the breathing. I, now you're listening now. I used to struggle with this. I do not have an incurable genetic defect. I do not have an incurable genetic defect. Therefore I can change. Therefore I can change. To quit stereotyping yourself. Great I feel feedback. like I need to Thank step you. out and let the two of you talk. I, I'm I'm thrilled because uh, you you read the book and then you realize exactly what Marshall said and then he said it later in the book have someone that calls you out on it. You don't realize how often you fall back right into those behaviors yeah. that that reinforce it. So it is that exact leadership and and that partnership that you have with people around you that'll get coaching. Yeah, exactly. I found that for me, the most effective, whenever I read a book, if I'm reading it along with somebody else and I have an accountability partner for that, it helps so much. Like even when when I read this, I read it with a friend. We were reading at the same time and we were talking about it almost every day. So we could help, you know, hey, how are you doing on this? What are you doing here? How, well, how did that impact you? I read it by myself. I internalize it. It's gone. But if I'm talking about it with somebody, it definitely helps. It's good. Now, let me give another one that I want to illustrate Michael's point. I teach people don't when somebody tries to help you, don't start a sentence with no, but or however. It's pretty straightforward stuff. Well, one guy in coaching is stubborn, opinionated. He says, But Marshall, I said, that's free. If I ever talk to you again, you start a sentence with no, but or however, I'm going to find you 20 bucks. So he goes, But Marshall, 20, no, 40, no, 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 60, 80, 100. He <laughs> lost $420 in an hour and a half. At the end of the hour and a half, though, he said, thank you. He said, I had no way. I did that 21 times where you throwing it in my face. How many times would I have done it had you not been throwing it in my face? 50, 100? No wonder people think I'm stubborn. When mm. people talk, the first thing I do is I prove that I'm right and they're wrong. He got so much better just learning that. I love that. As you know, Marshall, you and I talked about this before today. Um, Michael and I work for a family owned business. The Deerberg family has owned first bank since 1910, 114 years old at the time of this recording. Uh, most of our clientele are either privately, privately held or family owned businesses. As we've looked at the list of those that registered for this webinar today, most come from family business. Sure. You and I talked uh, an hour ago or so about how family businesses can be tricky. You take the emotion of everything we're talking about right now and put it into a father, son, mother, daughter, parent, child relationship. Talk about your experiences with that. I know you've worked with a lot of family owned companies and still continue to talk about that emotion. And how do we do this when it's family? Well, number one is everything I talk about is not less important than a family business. It's more important. Okay. Number one. And number two, uh, in a family business, very important. If you are the founder, the way you act when you come home, home if you want your kids to be in a business so many founders come home they talk about how miserable they are how hard they work they're not happy then they wonder why their kid doesn't want to be in the business well right. you know, duh you know they don't want to be you when they grow up yeah so very important if you're in a family business to be sensitive to that the other thing is in a family business i've worked with four brothers who are co-founders if you're working with a brother or sibling you you have to realize when you're at work there's certain things you cannot do 
that you're used to doing. You can't correct each other, yell at each other, swear at each other. You can't do that stuff. You're at work. You're in a professional relationship. So you need to be very clear in a family business. You know, when you're at work, you're at work. You're a professional. And you need to have that sense of how do I behave at work? Now, the two brothers can fight it out themselves by themselves. But when they go to work, they have to be professionals. And they have to be part of the same team. They can't sabotage each other when they go to work. So a lot of stuff like that, I think in a family, I think everything I teach is actually more important in a family business. Why? Relationships are more important. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. What do you tell that next gen that is maybe, I, I'm working with a couple of family businesses right now where there are multiple children at the next level, next generation, who there might be some silent bickering and battling going on over who's going to take over for mom or for dad. Yeah. I know communication is obviously an answer and maybe the answer, but in your experience, what have you done where you've worked with that next generation where there might be some bickering or some contention over who's going to be next? Well, the first thing is you have to realize it's fine to disagree, but the question is when and how. Okay. It's fine to disagree, but when do you disagree and how do you disagree? And it's also important to know what not to do, especially when you're around people from the company, how to act, how not to act. And basically, this is just management 101. The reality is many of these people have never been trained in management 101. They're not bad people. They're not evil people. They don't know any better. Like, you know, working with two brothers, these people have IQs of God knows what. They're both smarter than I am. Yet, bang, 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 fighting, arguing. You you can't do that at work. Yeah. Well, they're not bad people. Nobody told them this. Nobody just sat down and said, quit doing that. Yeah. This is dysfunctional. As, as brothers, fine, you argue, fine, that's okay. I mean, nothing wrong with that. You just don't go in front of all the employees and do that and expect them, because their their feeling is you don't interact together. Michael, you're leading a family-owned business as a non-family executive. Um, any questions you might have for Marshall? I have a couple that I'd like to address, but I'd like to defer to you first. If there's anything in a as a non-family executive leading a family-owned business. Certainly there are some some challenges, but some exciting things as well. Anything for you, Michael, come up before I dive into a couple of questions? As, as we yes, think absolutely. Up. I'm going to take advantage of this time and, and hopefully awesome. get some more coaching here. Yeah, there you go. Um, <laughs> I'll step yeah. back and just watch the party and eat some popcorn. Yes, Marshall. So before we get into the non-family-owned member running a family-owned business, one of the things that I see with family-owned businesses is the leaders that are currently running the business, whether it be founder or Gen 2 or Gen 3, there becomes at a certain point this giant need to pass on wisdom, to to be able to, hey, here's the life lessons that, that I've had, and I want you to learn from my experiences. Can you give some of those leaders tips for being able to create an environment that that, that those life lessons and wisdom are well-received? Yeah, the first thing is, um, back to what I said, it depends upon the other person's desire to listen to this. And if they're rolling their eyes and looking at you like, would you please shut up, old man? It probably is not going to do a lot of good. And if this comes off as some old man just telling war stories about their life, it can often go backwards on you. So I would suggest a little bit more of an interactive approach and also two-way learning. See, if this comes across as my mission in life is to preach at you, of course, I have nothing to improve myself. I'm just preaching at you today, much, much, much less effective. If the message is, look, I'm trying to get better, can you help me? You try to get better, I'm going to try to help you. That is much, much more powerful. And the other thing is, get in the habit of asking a question, how can I be better myself? And then expect them to do the same thing. Pierre uh, Hubert Jolie, CEO of Best Buy, great turnaround story. He wrote a book called The Power of Business. He talks about me being his coach. The Purpose of Business, excuse me, he talks about me being his coach. And, you know, it's a pretty clear message. He stands up in front of everybody and says, I want to get better. Help me. Well, and he said, I, 
I expect the same from you. We're all here to help each other, as opposed to let me be the wise old man, young boy, and tell you what you need to do. And that just doesn't seem to go over quite so well. And by the way, this stuff is easy to talk about in theory. It's tough in practice. Ready? I'm going to ask you two a question. Do you believe that customer satisfaction is important? Yes or no? Yes. Um, should we ask our customers for the input about how we can do even better? And should yes. we listen to these good customers? Uh, do you have a husband, wife, or partner at home? Yes. <laughs> You've been spending a lot of time asking that partner, what can I do to be a better partner in our relationship? That's a trickier answer. <laughs> what if they answer the question? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm grabbing the table now. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I don't have to sit at the yeah. dinner table with my customer. Yeah, yeah. right. And blah, blah, blah. Yeah, well, why, why don't you do it at home? Yeah. Well, you should. And so you guys, we get off this call. You're going to ask that partner of yours, what can I do to be a better partner here? Yeah. Yeah. You all didn't do good on that test. So I'm going to give you one more and I'm going to predict some more failure. So are we ready? Uh -oh. Here we go. We're ready. The expectation was set real high for us, Michael. Yeah. Yeah. Now uh, we're ready. Uh, do you believe honest communication is important? Yes. And should we encourage people to tell the truth? Definitely. And would you agree with me that punishing the messenger, yelling at those people trying to help you, that'd be a bad idea. Terrible right. idea. Yep. Now, I'm assuming neither one of you would do this, of course. Of course not. Well, I'm going to give you a case study. You have a hard day at work. You go home. Your husband, wife, friend, or partner is there. You get in the car, go to the store. You're driving to the store. Lots of traffic. Cars are cutting in front of you. That person in the front seat goes, look out, there's a red light up ahead. Did you say thank you? <laughs> <laughs> on a good day Thank you. yeah or, or did you say what do you mean there's a red light don't you think i can see i'm gonna drive this car well you see this stuff is real easy to preach not so easy to live yeah yeah not so easy to live yep Years ago, I called home one afternoon before I left home and my wife and I got into a conversation and she did just what you just said. She, she's much wiser than I am. And she said, you know, I've been thinking a lot about some of our friends going through some tough stuff and couples and, you know, what can I do to be a better wife? The trick for me was not to jump right into an answer because I didn't want her to think I've been thinking about this for a while, but I thought about it for a while and we had a really great dialogue and we've done a lot of that since. So yeah, think about your answer first. Have that that wisdom of the pause between the question and the response. So Good. I appreciate I, uh, that. I have a saying that we talk a lot of, about at work, and that is distance between stimulus and response. It it creates such a more positive feedback loop. Yeah. Um, Marshall, I, I've got one more question. As as you've seen it, and you've seen now generations of leaders. Right. How is the role of leader changing? As the workforce changes, as we go remote, there's just so many more facets. I would love to hear your take on the changing roles of leaders. Well, I think, you know, a couple of thoughts. One thing is, Peter Drucker said, the leader of the past who had to tell the leader of the future knows how to ask. That's becoming more and more true. I mean, more and more, you manage knowledge workers. They know more than you do. Mm -hmm. You can't just tell them what to do and how to do it. You've got to ask, you've got to listen, you've got to learn. If I know more than you, I could tell you what to do and how to do it and maybe get something out of it. You know more than me, I can't do that. Why you know more than me? So I think one role of the leader of the future is really you're asking more than you are telling because they know more than you. And the second thing is you have to realize that in this new generation of leaders, I just, I'm writing a new book now for MBA graduates, by the way. And you're in 25 to 30 year old category, 35. I can tell you, it's not easy. Uh, we get to get. I usually don't get anything that philosophical, or larger things. I will for a second. A uh, couple of very tough negative social phenomena have occurred. One is what I call extreme success. Everybody hears about these extreme successes. And you're reading about these billionaires and all that stuff. And by the way, the net worth difference between the richest person in the world and the 10th richest is greater than zero in the 10th richest. So we're reading about the athlete, the movie star, all these people. And you get this thing compared to them. 
we get this social comparison problem. And the other thing is you have social media. So what happens is many younger people really are not that happy with their lives. They're spending too much time on social comparison. They're looking at everybody else. And what they see on social media is not real anyway. They see these fake versions of people's lives. They think, why aren't I them? Well, they're not them either, right? Yet it's tough. So I think, you know, with younger people, it's important to be sensitive to the fact that in many ways their challenges are maybe bigger than ours were. Yeah. A couple of people sent questions in before this recording. Uh, one that came up was um, just, I'm going to read the question as I received it. Can you talk about the importance of influence and of teaching leaders today on how to be more of an influence? Well, I'm going to go to two things at once. I'm going to go back to the family business and talk about influence at the okay, same time. Right. Peter Drucker, again, I keep quoting Peter Drucker, a great, great thinker. He taught me this lesson. If everyone listens, listening to me learns nothing but this lesson, you're going to be a more effective leader, a more effective influencer, and you're going to have a better life. Lesson one, our mission on earth is to make a positive difference, not to prove how smart we are and not to prove how right we are. We get lost proving we're right and smart and all this nonsense. Who cares? We're not here on earth to prove we're smart or right. We're here to make a positive difference. Number two, every decision in life is made by the person who has the power to make the decision. Make peace with that. Hmm. Decisions aren't made based on logic, fairness, or rationality. The decision maker makes the decision. Point three from Peter Drucker. If I need to influence you, you have the power to make the decision. There's one word to describe you. That word is called customer. One word to describe me. That word is called salesperson. Customers do not have to buy. Right. Salespeople have to sell. You want to influence people. You got to think like a good salesperson. They don't have to buy. You got to sell. Now, there's two ways to look at the Peter Drucker lesson. First, managing up. Now, my friendly CEO, I'm going to give you a simple lesson. I hope you don't ever forget this one. Two words. Owner wins. Not necessarily owner's right or clever or anything else. Two words, owner wins. That's life. And it is shocking how many people don't understand this. I mean, I coach people with MBAs from Harvard. Nobody explained this to them. Like one guy, his name is Fred. He, he, he works for a company owned by KKR. I don't know if you know KKR, a large private equity firm, right? You know what he, Fred says? He's 41 years old. This is many years ago. He said, they can't tell me, Fred, what to do. Yeah, Henry Kravitz cannot tell you, punk 41-year-old Fred, what to do. <laughs> so in, in New York, they calculate how much it costs to get rid of Fred, a couple million bucks. They don't even care about the money. It's a pain in the butt to these people. I talked to Fred. I explained this Peter Drucker thing about decision maker. He goes, they can't tell me what to do. I said, Fred, I'm going to help you. Yes, they can, Fred. Henry Kravitz can indeed tell you, punk Fred, what to do. And I said, Fred, now I'm going to tell you exactly what to do. And if you do exactly what I say, I may save you. And if not, I got to go back to New York and tell mommy and daddy I can't help you. And you need a better coach. Fred, there's not a better coach, is there? No, nope, it's <laughs> over for you. <laughs> What's it going to be, Fred? <laughs> well, Fred, Fred, salute the flag. He was there 10 years, had great relationship. It all worked up. He just got lost. I'm working, you know, I just got lost. I'm working with another company. She she owns 100% of the company, not 50%, 100. She, a simple request of the CEO insults her and her grandkids over a $30,000 decision for a woman that's worth $5 billion. <laughs> just let me say, this is a very bad idea. You know? Does she own 20%? No, 50? No, how much? 100. That's not, it's her money, by the way. You know what she can do with her money? Whatever she wants. She thinks she wants. Because yep. you know why? It's her money. Well, <laughs> this sounds obvious. People don't get it. Now, let me talk about the reverse of this. When you do have the power, our instinct when we do have the power is have to prove the other person is wrong. You don't have to do that. Okay, Michael, let's say I report to you. You want to do X and I want to do Y. All right, maybe if it's not that important, do Y. Who cares? But it, maybe sometimes it is important. We you say, you know, and rather than proving I'm wrong, say, you know, Marshall, you're a smart person. I respect you. 
I want to do X for the following reasons, which we understand you want to do for the following reasons. You're making good points. I've thought about it. In this case, I still want to do X, and I want you to support X. He says, well, you know, Michael, I think you're wrong. You know, we say, maybe I am. By the way, if I'm not wrong this time, I'll be wrong sometime. I'll be wrong I, sometime. Now, I think I, there's there's one other saying that you've in, you've reinforced with me today. When they say, I think you're wrong, I might be, and thank you. Thank you for telling me that because it's so important to have people that work with you that are willing to look at you and say, I think you're wrong. Now, when we leave this room, I'm going to be on your team 100 and support you. But Michael, I think we're going down the wrong path. That is so important for, for us as leaders. And I think too many times we get stuck in the emperor has no clothes because we always have to be right. And we just push every idea down that doesn't agree with ours. Validation of, a, of an idea doesn't mean that's the direction that we're going. Let me give you another great learning from my friend, Alan Mulally. You got to realize Alan goes to Ford. He's never been in a car company in his life. Now he's the CEO of Ford. He had a great motto. Anybody ask him for a suggestion, you know what he says? Is there anyone in the Ford Motor Company can answer this question better than me? Hmm. If there is, let's talk to them. Yeah. He's very smart. What would happen if you made a suggestion? You know what they do? Yes, sir. They go do the dumb idea. The suggestion <laughs> became an order, as you talked about earlier on. That's it. Yep. Just breathe. Does anyone in the company, do they, can they answer it better than me? If the answer is yes, maybe I shouldn't be talking right now. <laughs> yeah. I Shut love up. that. I yeah. love that response. I do too. I do too. Yeah. It's a good discipline. Our instinct, by the way, good, you're a good person. He's a good person. Our instinct is to try to help the other person. And we think we're doing good. Well, the reality is we can be going in the wrong direction very quickly. You wrote a chapter for the Boomer Wisdom book I alluded to earlier that we're putting out. And one of the things that you mentioned on here is as as people are about to speak up in an organization, and I love this, I love the whole chapter, but one thing that you wrote was consider these four questions before you speak. Will this comment help your company? Will this comment help your customer? Will this comment help the person I'm talking to? Will this comment help the person I'm talking about? Can you talk about right. those questions? Yep. If the answer is no, 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 you don't need you to don't, do it. don't say it. Yeah. Don't say it. And too many times we say things without this filter. Not am I correct? Is this going to help anybody? Is it is the world becoming a better place because I talk right now? Well, if the answer is no, don't talk. It's okay. Nobody's making you say anything. Look, I've asked this question. What percent of all interpersonal communications time is spent on A, somebody talking about how smart, special, wonderful they are, or listening to that, plus B, somebody talking about how stupid and after bad someone else is, or listening to that? The average answer from over 1,000 responses is 65%. Hmm. I'm going to give everybody a strategy to save a lot of time. Quit doing that. <laughs> <laughs> you save Just a lot stop of time. It. Yeah. <laughs> Stop it. Quit doing that. Yeah. yeah. Quit talking about how smart you are and how dumb everybody else is. That'd yeah. save a lot of time right there. And if other people will do it, discourage them from doing it because then you have to listen to this babbling. Well, I want to be respectful speaking of time. Um, I want to give Michael the the chance. I've I've got more questions I could ask. And I think what we'll do is before we go into the last now, I've, got, more I've got one final bit of advice at the end, but you can ask me your question. Just save a couple of minutes for my last bit of advice. All right. Well, my question now is going to be more logistics. How do you you talked about Marshall at MarshallGoldsmith.com? You shared with me last week when we spoke about MarshallGoldsmith.ai. I had a lot of fun with that, plugging in a lot of questions about family business and other things. And, and your AI bot gave me some tremendous wisdom that I've already adhered and, and implemented into my daily life. So I encourage everyone to go to marshallgoldsmith.ai. And it's all free. Yeah, it's all free. It's great. And it's in, and, and Marshall likes to joke, how many languages do you speak? He speaks one, but on his AI, he speaks them all. So <laughs> if you're hearing this in Japanese today, feel free. You can answer that question as well. So, Michael, I'm going to go to you. Round out whatever other topics or questions you might have. I'm going to come back with one more, and then Marshall will let you close us out. So, Michael, anything that's that's pressing for you now? Sometimes I think it's a, a good trait of a leader to know when to shut up and listen. So Maybe Marshall not. said he wanted to have something to say, and I'm now extremely excited about that. I want to hear what that is, yeah. I'm going to shut up. <laughs> yeah, excellent. 
Well, then, Marshall, the only other question you, you talked about, MarshallGoldsmith.com, any other ways that yeah, we can just reach go you? To- you know, LinkedIn, I've got now LinkedIn. I can't have any more contacts because I'm already maxed out, but I got plenty of then you have all the followers you want. So I've got 1.5 million followers on LinkedIn. Yeah. So go to LinkedIn. I've always added new stuff. Uh, go to YouTube. I just put my name in. I've got, you know, two or 300 videos. Uh, MarshallGoldsmith.com, a lot of free stuff. Uh, MarshallGoldsmith.ai, I love that. Everything I know is on artificial intelligence and it's actually smarter than I am. So go to marshallgoldsmith.ai, ask it any questions. It's mind-blowing how good it is. Yeah. So that's it. All right, well, yeah. I'm going to ask my last question, then I'm going to go to you to wrap us up. And the only question I'm going to ask is this. You talked about this book that you're writing now, and I didn't write it down, Being Here While Being There. I'm taking that Being as Here a, While Getting There. While Getting There. Such a great topic, especially in a family business. The Deerberg family likes to think, and, and the Deerberg family has a winery up in, in Central California as well with a 250-year a strategic plan. And I didn't, I, you didn't misquote me there, 250 years. They're talking about getting there. In family business, I don't, think, I don't think that's any more important than it is in a family company. How do we stay here and operate here and function here. And I'm not, not trying to give you away, have you give away the recipe or the ingredients of your book, but one or two parts of wisdom on how to manage and be successful today while still thinking into the future. And then well, the first, finish with your, your thought. Well, the first part we're talking about is the being here part. Okay. And the being here part is actually more difficult at home than it is at work. So true. Yeah, one of the great people in my group is Pal Gasol, and you know he's a great guy, basketball player, played for the Lakers in a NBA Hall of Fame. And, Kobe Bryant's kids' yeah, godfather. He played, played with Kobe Bryant, he's just a great person, and you know he was he was in this group of sixty people that we spent hours with over COVID every weekend, and one of his challenges was being present when he was home. His wife said, "Look, you're training for the Olympics; it's a big sacrifice for me, the kids, but when you're with me, be with me." And one week he said, no, I didn't do good. And what happened? I was tired. Well, it's an important learning point. How tired were you, pal? Oh, so tired. I said, you know, my son and I, we spent a thousand bucks each to watch you play against the Boston Celtics uh, when you were with the Lakers, won the world championship. Remember that game? That was the best game of my life. I said, you're running up and down the court like a maniac. Were you tired? I said, I was exhausted. So I said, pal, when a coach called timeout, did you say, you know, coach Phil Jackson, I'm tired. He said, I never told a coach I was tired my entire life. And he said, playing with Kobe Bryant, if I'd have said I'm tired, <laughs> Kobe Bryant would have <laughs> yeah. me out. Uh, talk about feedback. <laughs> he said, no, I never did that. Well, I said, do you think your wife was impressed? <laughs> See, sometimes it's harder at home to be present because, you know, you relax, you let down, you forget these people are important. And it's easy. And now back to the being here while getting there. Back to the while getting there. Let me give you a good technique. A friend of mine is, he's running a bank um, in, in Florida, a CNB. I don't know if you know that bank, but in Florida. Anyway, great guy, George. So George wants everybody to, and I wrote an article about this. It's not a secret. It's in Chief Executive Magazine. George says to everybody, I want to spend four hours, do nothing, but this week focus on long-term strategy of the bank. Now, these are the top 12 people. Four hours, not unrealistic. At the end of the week, how many did it? None. They all got busy. Yeah. Well, back to the getting there, you really need to make this part of people's lives. If you don't, it doesn't happen. Everybody's just going to do their day-to-day work. And they get so wrapped up in that day-to-day work that spending that four hours a week to focus on a long-term strategy bank doesn't happen, even at the top, where they should be doing that every week. It doesn't happen. So I think it's a lot of what I say is all about discipline. It's all about discipline, discipline at home, discipline at work. And, you know, just as a person, just discipline. And again, back to your good point, Michael, just get over that. I need help. Look, we all need help. We all need help. It's okay. I need help. You need help. We all need help. You say, well, what about willpower? None of us have that much willpower. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if we all had willpower, we'd all be in perfect shape and work out and, you know, blah, 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 blah. Well, none of us have that much willpower, right? We all need help. So I would say just do what you can do on your own. And so if you can't do it on your own, quit being ashamed. Just get help. 
it's okay. And, and it's, don't feel ashamed. It's fine. Yeah. Okay, finally. Thank you. Final advice. I want everybody listening to breathe. Breathing, breathe, breathe. Ah, now, I want you to imagine you're 95 years old and you're just getting ready to die. It's all over. You're on that last, last breath. But before you take that last breath, you're given a beautiful gift. The ability to go back in time and talk to the person listening to me right now. The ability to help this person be a better leader. Much more important to have a better life. What advice on a personal and professional front would that wise old person facing death have for the you that is listening to me right now? Well, you don't have to say anything, do anything. Answer that question in your mind. Whatever you're thinking now, do that. In terms of performance appraisal, that's the only one that's going to matter. That old person says you did the right thing, you did the right thing. That old person says you made a mistake, you made a mistake. You never have to impress anyone but that person. Some friends of mine interviewed old folks who are dying, got this question. What advice would you have? On the personal side, three themes. Theme number one, three words. Be happy now. Don't get so busy chasing what you don't have. You cannot see what you do have. Many of the people listening to us are among the luckiest people that ever lived. Don't get so busy chasing what you don't have. You can't see all the blessings you do have. Number two, friends and family. Never get so busy climbing the ladder of success you forget about the people who love you. That's always a mistake. And number three, if you have a dream, just go for it. Because you don't when you're 45, you may not when you're 85. And business advice isn't much different. Number one, life is short. Have fun. You need to enjoy the process of life. Two, do whatever you can do to help people. The main reason to help people is much, it's not about money or status or getting ahead. The main reason to help people is much deeper. The 95-year-old you will be proud of because you did and disappointed if you do not. And if you do not believe this is true, you interview any CEO who has retired. I've interviewed very many. Ask them one question. What are you proud of? None of them talk about how much money they make or how big their office is. They only talk about the people they've helped. And the final advice is also the same. Go for it. The world's changing. Your industry is changing. Do what you think is right. May not want to. At least you tried. Old people, we seldom regret the risk we take and fail. We regret the risk we fail to take. And finally, as I've grown older, my mission in life's gotten simpler and simpler and simpler. My level of aspiration has gone down and down, impact up and up. Quit worrying about what I'm not going to change. Let me give you my goal on this call to the person listening to me right now, to you who's listening to me right now. I want very little goal to help you have a little better life. If anybody listening to this call has just a little better life based on anything I said, it's a good call for me. So thank you. Well, I can assure you that that has happened because I know how I have felt in this last hour. And um, there's been many spine tingling moments and comments that I've heard both from you and from Michael today in this conversation. So thank you for the, the privilege of getting to spend this time with you. Um, it's been a goal of mine for, for decades to, to meet you. And now not only to meet you, but to get this hour with you, Michael, any last comments before we close up? No, I appreciate the wisdom. Thank you for everything. And I'm still giddy. Me too. Me too. Thank you. So, for, so again, for those of you joining us today, thank you so much for taking the time. We hope as Marshall just mentioned that you've been touched by at least one thing that he has shared with us today. I'm sure you have been. We bring these webinars to you on a regular basis at First Bank because we recognize the opportunity and obligation and responsibility and really the privilege that we have to not only share the wisdom we have internally within First Bank, but more importantly, externally, the resources like Marshall, like Ken Blanchard, who we've had in the past, Dennis Jaffe and others that we've brought to you in the past who share their wisdom um, because they feel a calling to do so as well. And that's exactly how we feel. So again, Marshall Goldsmith, thank you for your time today. It's been an honor. And for those who joined us, thank you for, for taking time out of your day to join us as well. Thank you and just have a, a blessed day.